Okay. All right. Well, thanks for inviting me to talk to you today. Um, uh, my talk's entitled The Whole Worm, Brain Body Environment Models of C. elegans. And um, I thought that I would start by setting a little bit of context uh, into how this work sort of fits into my, my broader research program. Um, so I'm fairly broadly interested in theoretical and computational biology. And I'm doing work on sort of fundamental theories of, uh, of emergent individuals in computational biology, uh, protocell modeling, uh, evolution of genetic regulatory networks, evolution of cellular differentiation, uh, evolution of neural development, uh, work on the relationship between developmental bias and evolution, uh, something I call computational neuroethology, which is about the neural basis of behavior, modeling the neural basis of behavior in animals. Uh, I've done work on biorobotics and neuromorphic computing, um, work on the evolution and analysis of brain body environment systems, and then uh, some work on developing mathematical tools in dynamical systems theory and information theory to be applied to these brain body environment system models. And today what I'm gonna be focusing on is this brain body environment system modeling piece of, of the research program, okay? So the idea of this, of this work is basically trying to understand how behavior arises from the interaction between neural activity, bodies, and environments. I very much reject the idea that the nervous system is the sole sort of controller and producer of animal behavior. I think rather in terms of behavior being as being a property of this sort of brain body environment interactions. And the particular work we do in this area has really a synthetic component and an analytic component. So the synthetic component is that we basically use evolutionary algorithms as a way to generate brain body environment models where uh, Typically, what we're doing is maintaining a population of parameters describing a recurrent dynamical neural circuit that's placed into some kind of a model body, which is placed into a model environment, um, uh, which is evolved in order to produce some behavior of interest using uh, selection and reproduction and fitness evaluation. Okay. And then once we produce these brain body environment models, uh, my real interest in, in much of this work is in basically taking them apart, trying to figure out how they work um, by using these ma mathematical tools like dynamical systems theory and uh, information theory. And this approach has been applied to a pretty uh, wide variety of different sorts of behavior. Uh, at different levels of abstraction. Some of this work is more theoretically oriented. Some of the work is more empirically driven. And uh, Michael asked me to focus on one piece of, of this, which is the application of these ideas to uh, modeling C. elegans. Okay. So that's gonna be what I'm gonna be focusing on for the rest of the talk. So this C. elegans modeling work has been carried out in collaboration with my colleague, Eduardo Izquierdo, who should really be seen as the primary driver of this particular project. And also our, our former postdoc, Eric Olivares, who worked a lot on the locomotion models that I'm going to be describing. Okay. So um, Cenorhabditis elegans is a one millimeter long soil living nematode worm. Many of you uh, may be familiar with it. I imagine most everyone has at least heard about it. Uh, it has a range of interesting behavior, uh, including various modes of locomotion, uh, withdrawal responses, a variety of both positive and negative taxis, feeding behavior, reproductive behavior, and it's actually capable of learning, including associative learning, which is uh, somewhat remarkable. As a technical matter, it's uh, transparent to visible light, which is a really important uh, experimental uh, advantage. It's largely invariant. It's not completely invariant, but it's largely invariant. Its entire developmental lineage is known from the fertilized uh, cell through all the cell divisions and movements up to the entire adult animal. Um, its entire genome is sequenced. It was the first animal for which that was true. Uh, all of this stuff has been done decades ago. Um, from our perspective, perhaps the most important thing is there's a largely complete three-dimensional anatomical reconstruction 
of this entire animal. So it has exactly 959 somatic cells in its body. This is the adult hermaphrodite. There's also a smaller male that people also study, but most of the work has been done on the hermaphrodite, and that's what I'm going to be talking about. Um, we know, for example, these dark green uh, strips here, uh, it has 95 body wall muscles, each of which is known. Um, it has, uh, there, there's various digestive and reproductive organs within the animal that are anatomically characterized. I'm not going to be talking about that aspect at all. And perhaps most importantly for what we're going to be doing, um, its nervous system has been almost completely anatomically characterized. There are 302 neurons in the adult hermaphrodite, and there are you know, about 7,000 connections which can be broken up into chemical, electrical, and neuromuscular uh, synapses. Um, so we have a fairly complete connectome. We have a fairly complete map of this animal's body as well as its nervous system. And this is the only animal for which this is true. And it's the only animal for which it's likely to be true in the near future. Although other people are certainly working uh, to make this kind of progress on a variety of other animals. So my, my particular interest in this, in this uh, animal was basically that I think it's an ideal organism for sort of empirically testing uh, the various theoretical ideas that I've been working on in the context of brain body environment systems, uh, both methodological and analytical tools that we've developed. This is a, a really nice, I think, organism to test out some of those ideas and approaches. So that's, that's what attracted me to it. Um, if we're going to be building brain body environment models of C. elegans, then we're going to have to model its environment, its body, and its nervous system. So most of the experimental work that's done on C. elegans is performed actually in an agar gel in a petri dish. That's obviously not its natural habitat, but that is where the experiments are done. And so uh, our environment model is basically going to be modeling uh, agar in a dish. And uh, because of the low Reynolds numbers at which C. elegans operates in agar, um, we can pretty much get away with just modeling the gel uh, with, um, <coughs> excuse me, uh, with a linear drag force as shown here, okay? Uh, basically because of the Reynolds number, the resistive forces dominate and the inertial forces just don't play any significant role. So you can essentially model it with this linear drag model. We can also impose various uh, gradients on, on the agar. So for example, temperature, great temperature gradients and salinity gradients and things like that, the various kinds of uh, stimuli that C. elegans respond to. Okay. So the body model has two basic components to it. There's a, a sort of mechanical component, which is basically just trying to model uh, the mechanical response, the, the passive mechanical response of the body uh, to imposed forces. So that, that consists of two basic components. There is a stretch resistance modeled here with these red uh, elements to the cuticle itself. Okay, that resists stretching of the worm's body in various ways. And then C. elegans is pressurized. It's a muscular hydrostat. So it has internal pressure, which resists compression. And those are modeled with these blue uh, resistive elements. Uh, both of these sets of elements are modeled as damp springs, basically um, with activation dependent rest lengths I'm sorry, sorry, no. <laughs> Their model is damp springs, okay? And then we to that, we add a model of the musculature layered on top of that mechanical body model. And uh, that musculature is based on identified uh, muscle cells, those 95 somatic uh, body wall muscle cells that I mentioned earlier. Um, and those are modeled as, uh, as damp springs with activation dependent rest lengths, spring constants, and also damping coefficients. And we have a linear um, muscle activation dynamics. Uh, and basically, uh, except for the more anatomically accurate structure of the musculature, we're basically building on a body model that Boyle, Barron, and Cohen published in 2012. Uh, we completely re-implemented that model from scratch to make it efficient enough to do some of the things I'm going to show you later. But the actual design of the model is really due 
to them. And then finally, we've got the nervous system. Um, primarily, primarily, that means um, all the identified neurons, all the identified connections between them. Uh, each neuron you know, has a label. It's a unique individual. Uh, it's known which ones are sensory neurons, which ones are motor neurons, which ones are inner neurons, and, and so on. Um, unfortunately, that connectome, as, as wonderful as it is to have, is, is only really half at best of the story uh, that we need to model the nervous system. The other half of the story basically involves all of the dynamical aspects, the electrophysiology of the nerve cells and of the synaptic interactions um, and so on. And unfortunately, that's not very well characterized in C. elegans. There are individual nerve cells which have been studied um, and there's new optical techniques, optogenetic techniques, which are really being brought to bear now on C. elegans, which promises to improve that situation. But at present, we're really missing the electrophysiology. And that's both because the cell bodies are so small that uh, intracellular recording is very, very difficult. And it's also because the body, as I mentioned, is a muscular hydrostat. So if you actually poke it with an electrode, the body just bursts. Um, which doesn't really give you a good uh, basis for studying the behavior, behavior of the animal. Okay, so we use a simple dynamical neural model that can capture some of the known electrical properties of C. elegans neurons, which is sort of schematically illustrated here. Um, but there's a lot of, of work to be done on the realism of that. I should also mention that because not everybody's aware of this, uh, neurons in C. elegans are non-spiking. They do not generate traditional action potentials uh, because C. elegans actually lacks the voltage-gated sodium channels that are associated with traditional Hodgkin-Huxley action potentials. The muscles actually generate calcium spikes, and there's some discussion about the possibility of calcium spiking in the nerve cells themselves, but at least to my knowledge, that's still somewhat open. That doesn't mean that the neurons do not have nonlinear responses. They do have a mixture of voltage-gated current channels, just not the right mixture to produce the action potentials like we normally think of in nerve cells. Okay, so, so this is the kind of stuff we've got to put together in order to do a sort of whole animal model of C. elegans. Um, Next, I wanted to talk a little bit about our approach, and then I wanted to dive into some particular examples. Uh, I don't know what the, the general uh, norm is in these group presentations. Um, I've prepared about an hour talk. I'm hoping it's a little shorter than that, but I'm happy to take questions anytime or at the end. Uh, I can cut some things out of the talk later if, if our discussion pushes things too long. So I'll let you guide that, just let me know. I try to look at the chat window and the participants list, but if you wanna ask a question, your best bet is just to unmute yourself and interrupt me. It's fine, that's what I tell all the students in the classes I teach over Zoom. So anyway, our basic approach uh, looks like this. We start with some behavior of interest in C. elegans. When I say whole animal model, I don't mean we're modeling everything right from the beginning. We're focused on individual behaviors, okay? And typically in C. elegans, behaviors are described kinematically. So you basically have a motion video like this um, through a microscope to look at how it behaves, what kind of motions it produces in different circumstances, which can then be manipulated experimentally. And so when building our model of the environment, the body and the nervous system, we impose all those constraints that are available. Okay, like the gradients that are at play in the environment, the muscular structure, the, the connectome and all that, all that stuff. But as I emphasized, um, because the electrophysiology is unknown, that isn't enough to sit down and build a computational model that you could run. Uh, basically, we have a large number of unknown electrophysiological parameters in our neural model which are not experimentally set because they haven't been experimentally characterized, okay? And so uh, the approach that we use to deal with that is what we call constrained stochastic optimization. 
Uh, the basic idea is to use a, a stochastic optimization technique to try to find values of these unknown parameters that are consistent with the known constraints that we've imposed that can reproduce the behavior of the animal that we're trying to model. Okay, so uh, I, I've highlighted here in, in orange, you know, some of the parameters that we have to evolve in our neural model. So there are many more than two, but let's just imagine two parameters. So we can imagine we've got some fitness space, which is uh, reflecting some measure of how well our model worm reproduces the behavior of the actual worm. And then we, we can adjust all these parameters so as to optimize the fit between our model and the worm. Okay, and it's stochastic. So we have some population of searchers that are locally searching around and undergoing mutation and crossover and so on. And as the search progresses, they climb some local hill of fitness up to some peak. And that gives us a model worm. Okay. But because this process is stochastic and because the models are under constrained, if you repeat that process again and let this stochastic optimization unfold, you may climb a different peak achieving a different combination of parameters that also does a very good job of fitting the behavior. So that gives us another model worm. And uh, what we do is do this hundreds, sometimes thousands of times, so that we have a whole ensemble of possible models that fill out the unknown bits in different ways, but are all equally consistent with the known parts, as well as achieving the behavior that we're trying to model. And then uh, we basically study that entire ensemble as, as, uh, as the subject of interest rather than one individual model within it. And then based on that analysis, of course, the idea is that we will uncover different possible mechanisms by which uh, the, the worm may be able to produce that particular behavior uh, each of those mechanisms may have uh, predictions associated with them uh, that could then be used to focus experimental testing, which will derive new constraints that we can impose on future iterations of this process. I, I want to emphasize that I really think this kind of ensemble approach to, to modeling is much better matched to biology than the sort of build a single highly accurate model of something because there's so much variability in biology, and it's always going to be under constraint, right? So rather than sort of putting all your eggs in one basket, this is the model that models this particular worm, call him Fred, okay? That's not really what we generally want to do. We want to have something that's more general than that. And to do that, I really think we need this sort of ensemble modeling approach. Okay, so I'm about to shift into uh, the part of the talk where I'm going to take you through a few examples of this process. Maybe now would be a good time to pause and see if anybody has any questions about the setup and the approach here. Uh, I have a question regarding the um, connection between the non neurons uh, of the system. What those connection transmit if it's not spikes? So what they are transmitting? Well, I mean, there's still they're still synapses, so they're still they're still uh, communicating by neurotransmitter release, but you don't have to have spikes to release neurotransmitter in a nerve cell, right? All you need is to have enough depolarization uh, reaching a synaptic terminal to trigger the synaptic uh, the, the neurotransmitter release, and uh, because C. elegans neurons are so small and C. elegans itself is so small, it's a millimeter long, its entire body, you really don't need the sort of regenerative action potentials to transmit signals over long distances. There are no long distances in this animal. And so you basically get what's called graded neurotransmitter release, that the amount of neurotransmitter rele released by a, a presynaptic uh, you know, specialization um, is basically proportional to uh, the amount by which that terminal has been depolarized. Okay, so in, in that sense, the, you can simulate it by a regular neural network and not spiking neural network. That's... 
Well, I mean, even, <laughs> even spiking models, typically, uh, at least the biophysically grounded ones, typically use uh, differential equations, right? So some right. kind of Hodgkin-Huxley extended model. Um, uh, and one of the branches in that model is basically the sodium channels that play an important role in the generation of the action potential. C. elegans does not have those sodium channels, but they do have other branches, right? So you still have sort of voltage gated, you know, electrically mediated dynamics in the nervous system. It just doesn't involve uh, spiky pulses in action potential transmission. Right, but, but what I'm missing is the connection between those two dots are if it was spiking, so you transmit the spike. But if yeah. it's a regular neural network, you're not transmitting the spike, you're transmitting the gradient. So that's no, this the it, difference. In both cases, what you're transmitting is deflections in membrane potential. It's right. Just that, it's just that spikes ha have a much larger, sharper deflection, and it's regenerative. So it 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 gets repeated at every at every sort of point along the axon. When you do not have regenerative spikes, you still, if you depolarize a part of a nerve cell you're going to have electrical potential changes across the entire cell. And that's what's happening here. The cells are small enough, the animal is small enough, that if you depolarize uh, a nerve cell at one point from some other synapse on it, then that will cause a small depolarization at its synapses. And you sum those and you get enough to generate this graded neurotransmitter release, which is what goes on in C. elegans. Right. Does that make okay. sense? Yeah, yeah, thank you. Sure. Any other questions? Okay. I've learned to wait the sort of 10 seconds on Zoom uh, to make sure that I don't cut someone off who's starting to ask a question. I'm not hearing any other questions. So at this point, I will go ahead and move on to the examples. Uh, sorry, can you hear me? Uh, yeah, I can. Yeah, sorry, my, my speaker was bad. So what if you were to knock in a sodium channel into the neurons? Do you think that you could it basically force spiking into the worms and sort of see how the system which is built not to spike could you're, adapt to you're spiking? You're talking experimentally or? Yeah, in yeah, experimentally. Uh, you'd need to talk to an experimentalist okay. about that. I cool. mean, you know, there, there are interesting ways to do that in animals that you can get intracellular electrodes into. Uh, there's something called dynamic clamp, which lets you essentially uh, hallucinate <laughs> additional current channels just by uh, sensing the membrane potential, uh, amplifying it, running it through a little computer, which can mimic the uh, effects of a particular current channel that's not actually there and inject currents back into the nerve cell. So people do that all the time, but it does require being able to insert intracellular, you know, microelectrodes into the cells, which you really can't do. So for C. elegans, your best bet would have to be some kind of light manipulation. And I don't think that is, has high enough temporal resolution to do the, that sort of thing yet. So the other possibility I suppose you have in mind is genetically insert them. And there's been a lot of genetics done on C. elegans. Again, I'm not a, a C. elegans experimentalist, so I don't know the particulars, but I suppose you could um, at least in principle do such a thing. I, I actually think um, my understanding of the evolutionary literature on C. elegans is that they may have had sodium channels at one point and lost them. Um, and again, the thinking is you just really don't need them uh, at the scale at which uh, C. elegans operates. There are larger nematodes uh, like Ascaris, which, uh, which are big enough that action potentials are important for signal transmission. Anything else? All right, then let me get to the examples. So I'm going to talk about two main examples, but the second one has two subparts. So again, I can I can adjust the timing here depending on on what people are interested in and how the how the time goes. So the first example I want to talk about uh, is the first model that Eduardo and I did together when he was a postdoc with me, um, and that is salt clinotaxis. So C. elegans feed on bacteria, which produce salt as a sort of byproduct of their metabolism. And therefore, C. elegans uh, exhibits a positive taxis uh, in concentrations of salt. Okay. The particular way in which, uh, so there are different 
kinds of taxis. The one that, that we are modeling here is called clinotaxis, which basically involves a kind of gradual orientation uh, toward a source through the gradient by using biased oscillations. So, so the worm is oscillating back and forth as it locomotes, and those oscillations have a bias to them that cause its, causes its path to curve uh, in the direction of larger concentrations of, of salt. Okay. So, so that's the behavior that we're modeling. Here's just some experimental data showing uh, different, uh, con different uh, deposits of salt with the different worms starting here in the middle and just showing you how the tracks uh, climb the gradient uh, on agar in toward this, this salt concentration. So that's the first thing that we were interested in modeling. Okay, There's a particular way that the experimental literature uh, measures the, the efficiency, the quality with which a given worm is able to solve this problem called the chemotaxis index or chemotactic index, um, which is just basically an integral properly normalized of the, the distances of the worm uh, to the source of the stimulus, okay? And we used exactly that same measure as our fitness measure in our modeling. Uh, we worked with conical gradients. Uh, you can also use Gaussian gradients and pretty much everything that we found with conical uh, carried over to Gaussian gradients without, without much of a problem. This early work used a simplified body model, not the, the full complicated one I showed you a few slides earlier. I'm going to bring that back into the story a little bit later, but for now we're dealing with a much simpler model that basically uh, a head and neck model that just oscillates back and forth um, in a way that we're not modeling neurally. So it's just kind of a baseline background oscillation. Um, and then the main focus here was on the circuitry. So here's where we have this wonderful resource, the connectome, um, which is available electronically. And so we basically just data mined that connectome, uh, starting with all the chemosensory neurons in the animal that are sensitive to salt, asking for all neurons and all connections that go from those sensory neurons to the motor neurons that are known to innervate the head and neck muscles that control steering. Okay. So you can just do a search on the connectome and you pull out all those neurons and all those connections. One of the interesting things we found when you do that without any other constraints is that almost the entire nervous system of C. elegans lies on the path from chemosensory neurons to head and neck motor neurons. And this is something people don't appreciate about nervous systems, even really simple nervous systems, is how densely interconnected and recurrent they are. Okay, so if, if we just stuck with this, we'd have to conclude that, well, the whole nervous system is involved in salt clinotaxis. And if you do these kinds of searches for other sorts of uh, behaviors, you also see, typically see appreciable portions of the nervous system, okay? But concluding all possible paths is too wide of a net. It's too wide of a net to model, it's too wide of a net to understand, and it's likely too wide of a net as to what's really important about uh, different elements in the connectome for this behavior. So we basically imposed a series of constraints on our searches until we got it down to what we considered to be the minimal circuit that might be responsible for salt clinotaxis. And we, we did that by, by taking this network and uh, looking at the lengths of the paths. So as we, as we consider more and more direct paths, we're moving from right to left on these plots and neurons and connections are disappearing from this graph as we consider only the direct, more and more direct connections, okay? The idea being the direct connections are the strongest and most important ones, the more indirect ones are less important. There's also experimental evidence that certain neurons are important to salt clinotaxis because if you ablate them, uh, the salt clinotaxis behavior um, disappears. So we could also use that to select which of the subset of neurons in this graph were actually important. And finally, um, not only do we know uh, that there is anatomically a connection between one neuron and another, we, can also, we also can count how many synaptic contacts are actually made. 
Now we can't from that infer directly the strength of a connection, but if we make the assumption that the more synaptic contacts you have, the stronger the connection is likely to be, even if we have no way to quantify that exactly. And so we also used that information to prune this down to basically this network, which consists of the two known, uh, uh, known sensory neurons uh, that respond to salt that are known to be involved in the behavior, a sort of first layer uh, pair of inner neurons, a second layer pair of inner neurons, and then um, some motor neurons that, that innervate the head and neck muscles that are responsible for steering. And then we've, we put in a pattern generator, as I mentioned earlier, to drive the locomotion. So that's not coming from the connectome in this piece of work, okay? And one final thing we know, it turns out that these particular sensory neurons have actually been somewhat characterized by Suzuki et al., among others. And we know that one of them responds to upsteps in salt concentration, and the other one responds to downsteps in salt concentration, and they respond with particular time courses, sorry, this is the data, which we've explicitly built into our models. Okay, so as I said, the idea is you put as much experimental constraint as you have, and we use the optimization methods just to fill in the remaining details. Okay, so when we do that, we build a model of this minimal circuit with this reduced head-neck model in this conical gradient with using this fitness measure. Um, and then we run these evolutionary searches. Uh, this data is from 100 such runs. Um, this just shows you the fitness over time as the evolutionary search progressed. Um, the, the experiments in pink represent runs that achieved a, a mean chemotactic index of above 0.75. Uh, that number isn't necessarily meaning meaningful to you, but you should know that uh, in agar, given the distances that we started uh, our model worm away from the source, about 0.8 is the highest you could achieve theoretically. Okay, so 0.75 was the set of the subset of the searches that we focused on as doing a very good job solving uh, this problem, and then the red one shows you the very best one. It achieved a chemotactic index of 0 0.76. Okay. Um, so this just shows you what the worm tracks, the model worm tracks look like, starting it here with the peak of the salt here, and then randomizing its, its initial orientation. Um, this is a zoomed in part of the track. You can see how uh, the, the movement oscillations have different amplitudes and frequencies, what low concentration versus higher concentrations. Uh, and you can see how during the turns, uh, part of the, of the head movement is stretched out relative to the other part of the head movement, which is the, where the bias turns are coming in. And then we can focus on even a subset of that, and we can actually look at uh, the neural activity um, in each of these different identified neurons in the model. Okay, so we can get at all the details. Um, there are a lot of different sorts of analyses you can do on these models once you have them. And I just wanna briefly focus on one particular kind of analysis using the tools of information theory to track how information about changes in concentration uh, at the sensors sort of flow through the circuit to ultimately shape uh, the motor activity. Can I ask you a quick question? Sure. Uh, the sensor neurons, do they sense the local gradients or the absolute values? of? No, they, 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 they are sensitive to uh, essentially the, the temporal derivatives. So I, they, they're, the, one of them is sensitive to increases in concentration as you move, right? Not, it's not if you just held the sensor still, it wouldn't mm -hmm. sense a gradient. It senses mm -hmm. a value, but, but it responds to over time if the gradient's increasing or decreasing. Uh, uh, one of them, it, it responds to increases, the other one responds to decreases. I see. So the neurons, they have like a self-connection that... Well, they, they have, do. yeah, I mean, they have some intrinsic properties which mm. allow them to essentially differentiate, um, if you will, the, the, the salt chemosensory okay. signal. Okay.
Mm -hmm. All right, so again, lots of analyses we could do. I'm going to focus just on an information theoretic analysis. I'm only going to just dip our toes in a little bit. This is another whole paper, but so, so we do things like this. We basically manipulate uh, the concentration at the sensory neurons. Here, I'm just showing you some up steps and down steps, okay? But you can do other kinds of manipulations. Um, and then we compute, if we consider uh, a, a, a uniform distribution, say, over concentration steps, that's what I'm showing you in this particular uh, slide, then you can compute mutual information between uh, the size of the concentration step and the various components of the minimal circuit. And you can unfold this over time. So you can ask about the mutual information between the size of a given current step in, I don't know, the second layer, the left second layer inner neuron at some point in time after that step occurred, right? That's what we're seeing is these temporal trajectories of mutual information in the system in response to a concentration step here, okay? Um, and these are colored, uh, the, left, the left members of each pair of neurons or each four of the motor neurons is colored blue, the right one is colored red, and there's various markers here uh, just to sort of orient us to, for example, the step occurs here, the sensory neurons respond very quickly, the motor neurons respond sometime later, and the neck itself doesn't actually reflect any information about this change until uh, this particular delay, which is the time it takes for these signals to sort of propagate through the system and be integrated into any kind, any kind of meaningful information about what to do. Okay, so you, if you're not familiar with mutual information, uh, technically what it is, it's a measure of how much knowledge of the value of one random variable reduces our uncertainty about the value of another random variable. But I think the most intuitive way to think about mutual information is just a kind of generalized measure of correlation, okay? Um, it, it doesn't make any assumptions about linearity in relationships between things, but it does tell you something quanti quanti quantitative about what may be going on in one random variable after you've measured something or been told something about another random variable, okay? Uh, and also, uh, the sensory neurons and inner neurons do not, but the motor neurons, and therefore the neck is affected by, do receive input from the pattern generator itself, okay? So that imposes some rhythmic structure on the information that's in the motor neurons and also potentially in the neck that you don't have imposed up here, except insofar as rhythmic structure on the neck moves the head rhythmically, which will, can impose rhythmic structure onto the sensory signal that you get. And in fact, that's how it's doing the derivative is temporally sampling the gradient, right? A C. elegans is not big enough to do a spatial, uh, a spatial sample of the gradient, right? All its sensors are very, very close together at the very tip of its mouth. Okay, so this is just to give you the idea we can compute these information theoretic quantities about changes in concentration. Now I want to jump all the way to the end of the story because I don't have time to go through it in detail. All the details are in this paper um, and just show you the punchline. And that is that we can work out a kind of information architecture for this circuit as to how information flows through this circuit. So this might look like a circuit diagram of the sort that you'll see in a neuroscience kind of ball and stick picture with the heavier arrows being stronger connections and the, these arrows being lighter connect, uh, weaker connections and so on. But this is actually not a synaptic diagram. Rather, it's an information flow diagram. So let me unpack that a little bit. If we actually look at, for example, the information in, a in AIYL about changes in concentration over time, uh, then we get uh, pictures like this. So again, the blue is from A cell, the left one, and the red is from A sur, the right one, okay? And uh, the shade here of the neuron is, is not representing its activity, it's representing its information. How much information about uh, the concentration um, change is available in AIYL or AIYR over time, okay? Same thing here, these plots show for the second layer inner neurons. 
So you can observe things like uh, there's much more information in the left first layer inner neuron about concentration changes than there is in the right second layer inner neuron is the kind of thing you can read off of these plots. Okay, but at the second inner neuron layer, um, you see that the information is roughly symmetrically available on both the left and right side. And you can also look at the information in the motor neurons. Uh, there's a really interesting story there. Uh, there's a kind of information gating that goes on because of the rhythmic input to, uh, from the pattern generator. Sometimes uh, motor neurons have high information about concentration changes and other times they have low information. You can see this thing sort of oscillating up and down in, in, uh, in rhythm with uh, the pattern generator. Um, and so the, the pattern generator itself essentially opens a gate and lets information through to the motor neurons at certain phases, but closes that gate and doesn't let information through during other phases. You can also look at not the information available in any given neuron, but the information being transferred along these various pathways. Okay, so this shows the, the electrical connection between these, this shows the electrical connection between these, and this shows the chemical synapses that drive the second layer inner neurons from the first layer inner neurons. And so you can see interesting things like, um, uh, although AIZL, gets most of its information about concentration changes from AIYL, AIZR gets very little information from the first layer inner neurons, but it gets most of its information through the electrical connection, through the gap junction, which is a, a somewhat unexpected result because normally in electrophysiology, you think of gap junctions as of electrical synapses as just equalizing things, okay? But you can actually get asymmetric um, information transfer through uh, a gap junction, which is bi-directional in its operation. And so there's an interesting story there, okay, which I'm glossing over because I just want to whet your appetite here. Uh, but the most interesting thing we found in doing this information theoretic analysis is that this exact same information architecture, this pattern of information flow and availability uh, occurs throughout our ensemble of high performing uh, clinotaxis models, despite the fact that the actual parameters, the actual electrophysiological parameters that are evolved are very, very different across that ensemble. The information architecture itself is quite robust up to symmetry. Uh, you could flip this whole thing left to right and some of them would, would have, for example, the flow on this side rather than this side, but up to symmetry, you get the same pattern. And that's what's being showed in the plus or minus one standard deviation uh, areas around these plots. This is for the entire ensemble of high performing individuals. You see the same kinds of patterns of uh, information transfer and information availability. So that kind of suggests that this information architecture level of description might be a better, a more suitable level of abstraction if you're trying to identify general principles in a circuit like this then looking at the raw electrophysiological parameters, which in fact vary all over the place. All right, um, I have a little less than 15 minutes, so I, I'm going to maybe pick up the pace a little bit here, um, but I can go back and answer more detailed questions if, if they arise. So my second example is C. elegans locomotion. In, in the first piece of work, we had a very highly simplified uh, cartoon of how it is that C. elegans locomotes with this pattern generator just driving the head wiggling back and forth. Uh, in fact, locomotion is much more interesting and complicated than that in C. elegans. And there are, uh, since locomotion kind of serves as the substrate upon which all other behaviors in the animal are layered, it's definitely worth trying to understand a bit more about how that is generated. Okay, So there's a whole range of ideas about how C. elegans locomotes. Uh, I've arranged them here uh, along an axis that, that emphasizes how much intrinsic dynamics versus peripheral proprioceptive feedback dynamics plays a role in the locomotion. So at one end, you have sort of purely reflexively generated uh, locomotion. At the other hand, you have purely centrally or intrinsically generated uh, locomotion. And then you can have various mixtures of the two. This whole 
this whole range of possibilities you can see across the animal kingdom, and they remain somewhat open in C. elegans as to which is the right sort of picture as to what's driving locomotion in C. elegans. There are also a whole bunch of questions in the literature about C. elegans locomotion, including where is the, the rhythmic pattern generator? Where does it lie? Uh, how does it operate? How are those patterns propagated along the body to coordinate a swimming, crawling motion, uh, and so on and so forth. So these are the kind of questions that we had in the back of our minds when we approached trying to build a neuromechanical model of locomotion in this animal. So uh, I have two examples. Uh, one I'm going is, is more towards this end of the spectrum. It's more sensory driven. And then I'm going to show you a more centrally driven example. Okay, so the sensory driven example uh, assumes there's some kind of head circuit that might be involved that may or may not be intrinsically oscillatory. And then otherwise, the only thing available uh, are the, the uh, stretch receptor uh, feedback proprioception. Okay, so, so we pull circuitry out of the connectome. Uh, there's there's a, a sequence of ventral nerve cord circuitry. Uh, these are all motor neurons that drive the muscles in the, in the uh, the more posterior portion of the body, other than the head and the neck. So there's particular neurons and circuitry which make known uh, synapses on various groups of muscles. There are also uh, stretch receptors, which are indicated here with these long horizontal lines that sense uh, stretch in uh, one group of muscles or the other group of muscles. And then we also have built in some Sorry, was that somebody interrupting with a question? Okay. Um, then we also build in some of the head neurons and, and interconnections between them. This is only a tiny, tiny portion of the, uh, of the head circuitry. Um, but these particular uh, neurons um, are known to respond to stretch in the head. So they could be involved in, in locomotion. So the, otherwise the model makes no a priori assumptions about where the oscillations should originate or how they should propagate. Um, this model has a total of 235 states, each of which is described by either a differential or a differential, al differential algebraic equation, and a total of 71 free parameters, which we use the evolutionary algorithm to try uh, to find settings of those parameters such that when you place it in that more biomechanically realistic body matches the speed of locomotion of the worm on agar. Okay. So again, I'm showing you, uh, I think these are again, 100 runs, showing you the best ones um, that can almost perfectly match the locomotion speed. And then the orange is the very best of the entire lot, which is what I'm going to be uh, describing briefly now. So for example, here is a run of that orange individual uh, showing you how the body itself moves as that uh, circuit operates, and then showing you a subset of the stretch receptors, motor neurons, and muscle activations, which are in which subset are indicated here by the little bars uh, during that uh, locomotion. Okay, so this model, uh, as all of these dark blue ones do, achieves the specified speed of locomotion on agar. Um, that's the only thing we asked the model to do. So the fact that we're getting these nice sinusoidal oscillations, the properties of those oscillations and so on are all coming out of the model. They, they weren't put in uh, to be fit. And again, in limited time, let me just say that uh, the, the frequency and the wavelength of the propagating wave fall at least for a, a subset of the best performing ones fall well within the range of the frequency and wavelength that have been described experimentally for C. elegans. Some of them fall outside, but it, these models were not selected for their ability to reproduce this. So the fact that we actually hit it pretty well is interesting. Okay. Secondly, the model also matches, there's a particular profile of curvature that you see in a crawl in a worm crawling on agar um, with more 
extreme bending towards the head and, and straighter segments towards the tail. And we pretty well match that profile of curvature as well, even though once again, we did not evolve the model to match that curvature. Okay. So there's a bunch of analysis we did here on this. Um, I just want to briefly tell you that we showed that oscillations originate in the head in this model, even though we didn't say they had to. So it really is an instance of this idea. Um, we showed that, that uh, in some members of the ensemble, this actually forms a network oscillator. So it, it forms a central pattern generator, which stimulates the head to move back and forth. And then the stretch receptors propagate that to the rest of the body to make the rest of the body bend as well. In some of the members of the ensemble we, we evolved, there was no central oscillation. It's just that uh, it was purely a chain reflex, basically, that activity in the motor neurons caused the muscles in the head and neck to bend, and that fed back through stretch receptors onto the head motor neurons, as well as stimulated more posterior ventral nerve cord neurons to activate causing their segments to bend, stimulating their stretch receptors and so on. So again, it was very much this kind of a, an instance of the model. We, find, we, we finally uh, also discovered that there's purely mechanical propagation of the wave. If you just take a stiff rope and wiggle one end, okay, you're going to get propagating oscillations sort of flattening out over the length of the rope. And we found that that can occur in C. elegans as well, because if you lesion some of these um, stretch receptors so that there's no signal of stretch that would cause the more posterior segments to bend, you can still get wave propagation across one or two segments of lesioning simply because the bend propagates mechanically, which then stimulates stretch receptors after the lesioned section. So I'm just throwing a bunch of these things out there. These are the kinds of things that you can find by, by studying this model. The second kind of model we did was at the other extreme, a purely central pattern generator based model. And we looked at this because there were a lot of arguments in the literature in C. elegans locomotion that argued that C. elegans could not possibly locomote with a purely central pattern generator setup. It just didn't have the right kind of neurons, the right current channels, the right connections and so on. Well, we said, you know, that's a really good question to test with a model. Okay, uh, a possibility, a feasibility question. Is it at all possible, given what we know about C. elegans, for it to locomote using central pattern generation? Uh, so we drew on uh, some work by Haspel and O'Donovan uh, that sort of built up a, a statistical characterization of a repeating structure of neurons and uh, connections in the ventral nerve cord. And uh, for this work, we just looked at one at one of these quote unquote segments. So not really segments, but they're sort of repeating units that you see when you do this statistical analysis on the connectome. And we said, can we evolve those things to oscillate given only the connections between them that we know that exist in the connectome? Okay. So there's no body model here. And just to make it a little more interesting, we ask not only can we make these things oscillate in the way that they are known to do during forward locomotion? But we also ask if our solutions could produce the different phase relationships that you see during backward locomotion. Now, again, there's no locomotion here because there's no body. So all we're trying to match are the differing phase relationships within the oscillations of one of these, of one of these units. Uh, so to do that forward-backward switch, we, we also build in a model of two uh, sort of premotor interneurons that are known, if you manipulate these two, you can switch the worm swinging, swimming from forward to backward. Okay? So we evolved circuits that could produce these different phase patterns, depending on whether AVA and AVB were off-on or on-off, basically. Um, this is an example of one of the evolved uh, solutions. And this is an example of the, the, um, the activity that you see in these, uh, this evolved model circuit, which is indeed producing an oscillation with the right amplitude and frequency 
that if you put a bunch of these together and connected it up to a body should make the body locomote. We can't confirm that here because we're just looking at this isolated circuit. And furthermore, when you switch AVA and AVB off and on, you switch between the forward and backward locomotion patterns. And you can even show that if you take uh, a trace of AVA and AVB activity recorded from a worm, so this is experimentally recorded, okay, and use it to drive our model AVA and AVB, that it indeed switches between these two different patterns for forward and backward locomotion. Okay, I think I've only got three more slides. So I think I'm just going to keep plowing ahead. And if 11 o'clock is a really hard, I'm sorry, if noon is a really hard limit for these, you know, feel free to, to, to beg off. Yeah, it's okay. Keep going. Okay. So unlike what people expected, there is sufficient structure in the connectome that ventral nerve cord motor neurons can produce a network oscillator. But can they, that network oscillator really be used to drive the normal locomotion of C. elegans? Well, to do that, oh, I'm sorry, I'm going to skip this. We, we did some various analyses of how that circuit worked, which I don't have time to talk about. Um, so, so the second half of this CPG uh, study looked at what if we take multiple copies of the sort of minimal unit in the ventral nerve cord and connect them up using known uh, chemotactic and electrical uh, connections and put that whole thing into our biomechanical body, which I've shown you previously, could we actually get a completely centrally driven uh, locomotion circuit out? Okay. And to make a long story short, yes, we can. Here's an example of that biomechanical body uh, moving under an evolved uh, network of ventral nerve cord CPGs interconnected with known chemical and, and electrical synapses. Further, we can go in and analyze how the wave is actually being propagated uh, in different members of this ensemble of CPG locomotion models that we produced. And interestingly, none of the chemical connections play any role in any member of, an, or, of our ensemble. It's all electrical connections. And there are different subsets of the electrical connections that work, okay? Two of them uh, move in the direction that you would expect, which is from head to tail, but one of them actually coordinates in the opposite direction, from tail to head. Because these electrical synapses are bidirectional, as gap junctions are, you could actually get a sort of retrograde coordination, which still produces the right um, uh, head to tail propagation of the, of the contraction in the muscles. And you can calculate various quantitative things that differ in each of these different possible solutions uh, based on looking at how they work. And finally, you can actually go back into the raw connectome rather than the sort of statistical summary that I mentioned that we used and show that actually all three of these mechanisms are available uh, within the actual connectome. It varies from segment to segment. I should segment to segment. Again, this isn't a segmented animal, but it varies along the ventral nerve cord. So all of these mechanisms could possibly be operating um, so the bottom line here is we've shown that C. elegans locomotion could be driven completely, either sent either peripherally or centrally, that both options are available. And in fact, as is typically the case in, in rhythmic pattern generators in biology, it's likely to be some combination of the two. But there is not enough experimental data to uh, argue, as some people have tried to do, for a fully peripheral uh, kind of locomotion system. Okay. Finally, let me just mention that uh, we've also done some work on integrating uh, different models of behavior. So here's, a, here's a, a model worm that has the clinotaxis circuit from the salt clinotaxis work, and it has an earlier, excuse me, an earlier version of the, of the proprioceptively driven uh, locomotion system, and we co-evolved these two circuits 
to basically allow the model worm to climb gradients towards uh, salt concentrations. And this is just showing you that you can, in fact, evolve multiple of these, uh, of these kinds of behaviors together in a neuromechanical model. Uh, finally, let me just wrap up. Um, so to summarize what I've, what I've tried to do in this talk very quickly, I've, I've zipped over a lot of stuff, but um, the goal of the, of the research program that I've specifically talked about today is really uh, to try to develop whole animal models of behavior of an organism, okay? The brain, the body, and the environment of an entire organism. And I've suggested to you that C. elegans has a variety of different advantages for, for being maybe the first organism where that could be possible. We're a long way from that goal, okay? But it seems within reach. Um, the particular, I've argued for a specific methodology for various reasons uh, that consists of constrained stochastic optimization and ensemble analysis, rather than trying to sort of wire up a specific single model based purely on experimental characterizations of a bunch of different worms and studying the ensemble that we get out of those optimizations. I showed you um, an application to salt clinotaxis of this methodology. And I, I gave you a hint of one of the kinds of analyses that we can perform on the ensemble, looking at the, how information flows throughout the system. Uh, then I talked a little bit about a second example, locomotion behavior, where we looked at sensory driven and centrally driven possibilities there. And I briefly hinted at a future possibility where we might be able to integrate uh, better and better models of multiple uh, neuromechanical uh, understandings of different behaviors in this animal. I want to end with two sort of general take homes, and then I'm finished. The first one is I want to really emphasize uh, how important I think it is to use models throughout the scientific process rather than just as sort of a capstone after a complete experimental analysis. I probably don't need to, to lecture about this to this group, but the majority of people that I talk to about uh, biology, experimental biologies, uh, people I talk to about this sort of work say, well, you can't model yet. We, we, we haven't done all the experiments. We don't know enough. And my argument is, and I hope I've given you a hint of this here, that no, you should model from day one. Models are made to be broken, but they, the, the ways in which models break help focus your thinking about what experiments need to be done next and what consequences follow from the data that you already have and where does more data really need to be, to be gathered to uh, distinguish between different possibilities. And the second thing I wanna emphasize is um, that more generally, this sort of brain body environment perspective on the mechanisms of animal behavior and some of the theoretical concepts and the synthetic methodology and analytical tools that go along with that, which I've primarily developed in simulation, in toy models, can actually be applied to real biological systems, I believe, and, and is, a, is an important way to gain insight into how they operate as integrated wholes. All right, I'm done. Thank you for your attention. Excellent, thank you so much. Um, does anybody else have questions? Um, yeah, actually, I was kind of interested in the um, the CPGs, the like or the pattern generators. That was yeah. really interesting. And I was wondering, do you think that in addition to like them kind of coordinating between each other, is it possible that there's actually like some kind of maybe like pacemaker neurons that exist in the ventral nerve cord, or is there any evidence? That is a great question. So, um, ironically, uh, the literature uh, on C. elegans locomotion started out as CPGs aren't going to work. There are there are no CPGs, okay, of any kind, either network oscillators or pacemaker neuron driven. We showed that in fact network oscillators could be there, okay. And very recently, I can't remember the experimental lab, but recently people have found uh, some evidence for actual pacemaker neurons in the ventral nerve cord, okay, which of course. Uh, a network oscillator of the sort that we've shown here does not require pacemaker nerve cells, but it certainly 
can work with pacemaker nerve cells. Uh, pacemaker neurons make it easier to produce rhythms intrinsically than non pacemaker nerve cells. So yes, there is very recently some evidence that there may be pacemaker neurons as well. So, so the literature is sort of turning 180 degrees from no, it's all sensory driven to people discovering more and more possibilities for, for sort of central rhythm generation. Cool, thank you. Mm -hmm. Anybody else? Uh, Randy, I have a quick question. Um, mm -hmm. So in your whole, uh, whole animal models, what role do you think the body plays in relation to the brain? Would you, I don't know if you have done some analysis along those lines, but would you expect the brain to be more sort of influential than the body or maybe at least with respect to the worms, what do you think? Yeah, I mean, I don't think there's a, a general answer to that question. Um, you know, take locomotion, for example, here. Um, if there are not central elements in parts of the ventral nerve cord, because you could have, as I pointed out, you could have pacemaker cells and network oscillators at one part of the cord, but not at another part, right? So you could have a combination of all these. So if there are not central elements at some part of the ventral nerve cord, then feedback through the body, as well as the mechanical propagation of contraction waves is going to be essential to producing a whole body coordinated movement. Okay. So, so there's an example where you really can't separate the two out, but that does not mean that there aren't things that are primarily uh, neurally driven as well. And the whole point of this sort of brain body environment perspective is that the general picture that you should be focused on is this, and it becomes an empirical question in a particular animal for a particular behavior, you know, what responsibility does the relevant neural circuitry uh, have? What role does the body play? What role does feedback through the environment play? Um, when you are locomoting, for example, it's not so much crawling on agar, but swimming. Uh, there, there are features of the medium through which you're moving that also play a really important role in the mechanical generation of, and propagation of force along your body, right? So it's not just the body, it can also be the environment in, in some cases. Um, and, and stepping aside from C. elegans for a moment, you know, the broader brain body environment research program that I've been, that I've been working on for a long time um, has many, many examples of that where you see even sort of more cognitively oriented kinds of tasks that rely in important ways on structure in the environment or in structure in the body. So, so my idea is that we just need to have a larger theoretical playing field, namely the brain body environment uh, perspective in which to ask questions rather than presupposing the answers to such questions about what role each of the components actually contribute, what role they actually play in a behavior. Does that answer your question? Yeah, absolutely. Thank you. Mm -hmm. Um, Randy, one, one uh, sort of meta question in, in your uh, evolutionary searches, right? If, yeah. Do you ever, um, how, how much time do you spend looking at um, not the specific solutions that were found, but kind of the path to it in terms of what, what things are easy to evolve, what's different, what kinds of encodings work better? You know, what, what, what have you learned about the, the search for these kinds of models? So, um, I mean, again, it's hard to make general statements. Uh, Every problem, every fitness measure is a little different. Um, you almost always have to grapple with that in any of these projects because it's, it's a practical barrier to getting solutions. But I rarely have made that the focus of, of our work. Um, there are a few cases where we've actually looked at, uh, at that question, um, not on these empirically driven problems, but on some of our more abstract toy problems like walking, for example, where, where we looked at, at the structure of sort of, you, you often see these patterns where certain parts are solved first or certain features of the, of the body say are, are incorporated into a, an evolving solution first and then that scaffolds other features. So you do see things like that. Um, I really haven't made a study of that a central focus of, of my work. 
think it would be a very rich area for somebody to look at. Yeah, I was just thinking from the perspective of evolvability, right, and and sort of developmental encoding, yeah. which well, one of the one of the motivations for that developmental model work I've done a long time ago now was, I mean, clearly, uh, biological development has uh, a very complicated nonlinear dynamical process, as everybody here knows very very well, interposed between the genetics and the phenotype, and that clearly structures um, the search space. I mean, this, is, this, this very question was why we looked at developmental bias and how it affects the flow of evolution, um, for example. So it would be very helpful to have uh, development brought into the picture. The problem is that um, unless you focus on development itself, uh, let me see, how do I want to say it? If you just throw development in there, some sort of off the cuff model of development, you're just as likely to make the search problem worse as you are better. Development itself, as again, everybody here knows very, very well, is a very rich, interesting process that's itself deserving of a great deal of theoretical modeling and experimental analysis. And once we have a better model of development that we you know, have some uh, confidence in, and you may already be able to pull, put together, or put forward a couple of those, then it would be interesting to see when you put that into an evolutionary process, what happens. Yeah. I yeah. mean, there are people like Josh, right, who've looked at incorporating, Josh Bungard, who've looked at incorporating developmental models in, into uh, evolutionary processes. So it's not, it's not something that, that no one's ever looked at. Uh, it's just not th something I focused on too much, except some of that developmental modeling work, the older work I mentioned at the very beginning. Yep. Got it. Okay. Well, thank you so much. That was great.